night, everybody. Welcome to the Extended Reach Foster Pod, your place for all foster care and community-based topics. This is episode two. I am your host, Leanna Riddle, and I also have my wonderful co-host with me, Emily Parks. Shout out to everyone who we saw at TACFIS. That was a great turnout. That was earlier this month. Um, We love seeing all of your beautiful faces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever we are at a conference, please come and say hi because um, we just love interacting with you all. Um, I hope that you were all able to snag one of our awesome Extended Reach t-shirts when you were there at the booth visiting us. I hope that you're enjoying them because I enjoy mine. So uh, if if you were at the the conference and you uh, missed our booth or um, you weren't able to get a t-shirt, please let us know and we'll uh, send one your way. Ooh, nice. <laughs> Our guest today is from Texas, and um, Emily's from Texas too, if you all remember, and I'm in Denver, and so I thought to maybe start off this episode, it would be great to start with a Texas-esque joke um, to kick things off. <laughs> okay. Let's do it. Tell me. So, Tell me. Right. What you got? <laughs> what, what did the... What did the horse to say when it fell over? We don't all ride horses in Texas. No, we do. You, don't. you guys don't all ride horses? <laughs> what did the horse say when he fell over? He said, help, I've fallen and I can't giddy up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> our, our horses might say that if they fall Oh, over. was that bad? I thought <laughs> it was good. I laughed. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I have seen a picture of somebody going through the Starbucks on a horse. I have wow. seen that. It has happened um, in Texas. So, yeah. I mean, if I had a horse and I was in Texas, I'd probably do the same thing. Probably. You know, why yeah. not? All right. Well, let's let's get uh, let's get on our topic here. We could talk about Texas and horses all day, couldn't we? Yeah, we could. <laughs> so I'm so excited about this episode. Um, we're going to be interviewing um, one of my dear friends and colleagues. We've known each other for about 20 years. I actually hired her to work for me at the detention center um, way back in the day when we were super young and didn't really know what we were doing. But uh, we're going to be talking about nurse family partnership today. Um, If you aren't familiar with that, I think you're going to get some really great news. Uh, If you are familiar with it, you're going to just kind of hear some different statistics, some ways that you can make referrals, um, how you can incorporate nurse family partnership if you are a foster agency, if you're working with teens, pregnant teens, or if you're community-based, how to do referrals if you have any first-time clients coming on. So without further ado, let's get uh, Kim Hamilton on and let's get started with our podcast. Let's go. All right. It's going to be a good one. So excited to have one of my dear friends and colleagues, uh, Kim Hamilton. Um, we go way, way back. I guess we've known each other, I guess we figured out about 20 years or so. Um, yeah. We worked together at the Lubbock County Juvenile Justice Center a long, long time ago, working in juvenile detention together. So um, we're excited to have you here today to talk about Nurse Family Partnership and how uh, that program works, what all you do. Um, We'll be talking about some specifics today. Um, Before we do that, though, um, we always like to ask a fun question, put you on the spot there. Uh, I'm going to let Leanna um, ask you that fun question, and we'll see where that takes us. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, so um, Kim, we all know that it's that time of year, we get spooky, we dress up, you know what I'm talking about? It's Halloween time. So um, I want to know, what is your favorite Halloween candy? Um, my favorite Halloween candy is pretty much anything sour. I love like sour Skittles and Sour, and, um, sour Patch Kids, so sometimes uh, I eat them until my tongue has one of those terrible little sores on them and it's awful. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Living life on the edge. That's a bit too extreme for me. Sour. Yeah. I stick more on the plain side. Like Smarties. Those are pretty plain, but they're delicious. Mm, yeah. So. <laughs> the Tootsie Rolls are always what's at the bottom of the bag. The, mm-hmm. you know, the yep. on there that Tootsie Rolls hard. can stay down there, in my opinion. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm not eating sugar these days, so I don't get to have any Halloween candy, but if I was, it would be Reese's peanut butter. Mm, peanut butter. Yum. I'd be very, very happy. So um, I'll <laughs> used to steal those out of my son's thing. But. Yeah, and now they have dark chocolate Reese's. How evil is that? Mm. Oh, wow. Stop it. So evil, so evil. Perfect. 
All right, so uh, let's get started with our interview today. Um, Kim, will you just kind of tell us what your, we already know your name's Kim Hamilton, but tell us about what you've done, tell us about your background, what you do, just give us a, an, an introduction of yourself. Sure, so um, I started off in corrections, and juvenile corrections, um, got my master's in counselor education, so, uh, and then I became a therapist there, so I did therapy with kids that were uh, locked up short term and then um, moved on. I actually went back to nursing school after that. So yeah, that second career. But uh, at, to do part time work uh, at the juvenile center, I um, I did family therapy with the kids that were in the long term program there um, for about. They were usually there about a year, um, somewhere in there. And so I did family therapy with them so that um, you know, when they transitioned home, that there was some kind of change and some kind of understanding, hopefully. So, and then like I said, I went to nursing school. I worked in substance abuse treatment for about five years with a population that was private pay. Um, and it was a great treatment facility. I just did not enjoy that population as much. Um, There's some entitlement there and some things that I just had a hard time with. So I decided I wanted to go back to the public sector and I really, really enjoyed working with moms and babies. And so I found Nurse Family Partnership and I've been there for um, nine years on October the 18th, just the other day. Um, so, and we're housed by the uh, Texas Tech Health Sciences Center, School of Nursing, Larry Combes Community Health and Wellness Center. Uh, so they partner with us in our grant. They, uh, they have some um, matching money that we get. So we're actually employees of the Health Sciences Center, which is fantastic. That's a great uh, opportunity to be employed by the state. So uh, that's how I came to Nurse Family Partnership. Okay, and, and Nurse Family Partnership is a nationwide program. Not, I don't think all states may be participating, but a lot of states are participating and you are currently in Texas participating in nurse family partnership in that state yes. um, but yes. it is it is nationwide if certain states choose to participate it is. I, th I believe it's in 42 states uh including the u.s and virgin islands so there's all of that option to transfer <laughs> well, betting on that <laughs> maybe maybe retirement but yeah that, um they, they're everywhere and so um yeah not in all states but catching up quickly and expanding rapidly and got some federal money to expand so um it's coming around and it's getting more well known Okay, cool. All right. Well, um, you know, you mentioned that they're in about 42 states. I even saw that you guys um, work with uh, the tribal communities, which is really awesome. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about really what Nurse Family Partnership does and, you know, the specific, you know, demographics that you, you know, serve? Sure. So the program has just a few qualifications that really um, make you eligible for the program. You have to be a first-time mom, uh, and the reason for that is because um, research shows that when a mom is pregnant, um, she's really thinking about the things that she might want to change in her life, and, and this is a moment where you have a serious talk with yourself about the health and wellness of your baby and your body and the choices that you're making, and really um, the opportunity to say, i got to do something different. And so we get these moms in, uh, in pregnancy. They have to be uh, enrolled before their 28th week of pregnancy. So pretty much the whole pregnancy, but that, that latter part, um, which, you know, makes some moms ineligible because they get to us at a, a too late of a date, but um, we do the best we can to touch them and get them enrolled before that, that cutoff date. Um, and the other things are that you have to be eligible for Medicaid. Um, so it's low income, first time mothers. Uh, and there is some talk to expand possibly to um, subsequent children uh, or maybe moms who have just not parented but had a live birth. So if they uh, chose to do adoption and then they have a pregnancy later on and choose to parent this child, then uh, they would be eligible for the program under some of the new um, rules and guidelines that we've adopted. So we're, we're trying to expand and serve more mothers and more capacities. Uh, but those are the basic um, qualifications that you, uh, you need to get on the program. Nice. And if I understand correctly, you serve dads as well? We serve them as a dyad. Um, okay. if, if mom has a child, of course, they're during pregnancy. So if dad is there, we incorporate him in all the visits. Um, we give him education about um, uh, paternity and things like that. So that they're well educated about that. Um, and, you know, there are some strange situations where um, possibly a 
a dyad changes from we were seeing mom and baby, but mom becomes incarcerated or mom leaves, um, then we would change the uh, dyad to be dad and baby or uh, grandma and baby or, or whomever is uh, caring for that child. And of course, our, our um, information that we present might change a little bit depending on who's there. Um, but we, have, we are able to continue to serve that baby as long as there's a dyad with a caregiver and a baby. It does not have to be mom, um, except in the beginning, obviously. Just Interesting. Interesting. I didn't yeah. know that. So yeah, what, highly, that highly thing, encourage dad's participation. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that we, we have a lot of agencies who are doing kinship care, so they're looking for alternative caregivers and things like that. So I'm assuming you guys are kind of helping or looking, you know, for who else can be in that diet to help raise this child and help yeah. help them for the first yeah. couple if, if it's not a family member, I do know of several occasions where the child has gone into foster care and they have visited with uh, maybe mom who is trying to get to uh, regain custody and also the foster parents, you know, they've, they've gone and visited and done assessments on the child to make sure the child's developing normally. So one, one, of course, huge area is to help this mom regain custody and parent. And we can be such a great advocate for that because we are providing parenting in the home. We are monitoring the status of whatever's going on with what our reporters, we work with CPS. So absolutely, we want, we want the best place for that child to go, whether that's back with mom or whether that's with foster care or kinship or whoever. Um, but we continue to serve that dyad as long as we possibly can to make sure that um, somebody has eyes on and that you know, this child has an advocate. Sure, that's awesome. So tell me, you get a referral, kind of walk me through what those next steps would be and what services might look like. Okay. Um, we, we, we get phone, I mean, we do uh, phone calls for referrals. So we get referrals from a multitude of agencies. Um, our, our site gets a lot of referrals from um, healthcare providers, a lot of pregnancy testing centers, um, because they know that they have to be referred during pregnancy. Um, so most of the time when we get our moms, they're already in care, which is great, you know, because that's important. Uh, but sometimes not, so we, we assist them in, in getting into care as soon as possible. Uh, other sites around the country um, are associated with a health department or um, county or city health departments, and so they uh, they get referrals from different agencies. A lot of uh, Texas uh, sites get referrals from WIC because those pregnant moms are looking for those services, and so they um, they give us referrals. So there's a, a multitude of different places, but because it has to be during pregnancy, it's a lot of pregnancy-related services that we get uh, referrals from. So we do, uh, you know, a phone touch or text or whatever and say, hey, you know, uh, we got a referral that you might be interested in this program for first time moms. And, uh, you know, can we come out and tell you more about the program? Can we answer questions about it? Is this something that you would be interested in? Um, because we do home visits, um, you know, it's, that's a big amount of trust for someone who, um, especially who's been in the system before or been in contact with the system or in care before, Letting somebody into your home and seeing, you know, flipping back the covers and saying, like, this is my life, this is where we live. You can clean yourself up and go to the doctor's office and be like, this is me, this is my baby, I'm really cute. But when it's in your house, it's really real, for real, for real. And so, you know, that's a lot of trust. So, you know, sometimes they agree right up front and say, yeah, that sounds fantastic. And sometimes there's hesitation. So I try to just open myself, just, you know, meet me. Let me tell you about the program. Let me um, let me come and show you what opportunity this is. And um, like I said, it's a lot of trust. But so the first um, the first contact usually we try to get an enrollment, try to get some signature, um, and then the services continue from uh, that day from pregnancy until the baby turns two years old. So this is an extremely long program. Um, so this is a commitment, you know, we ask for a commitment. It's not an obligation, of course, it's a voluntary program, but um, we ask that they see it through because those are where we get the outcome. At two years is where things have really changed and we've really impacted um, the trajectory of this child's life at that point. Mm -hmm. And mom. Right, absolutely. And so you're doing like parenting classes, are you doing, or parenting, you know, type, showing them, is it like hands-on or materials? Oh, yeah. Yes, very much. So we have facilitators that we take out. Um, the great thing about Nurse Family Partnership is that it is tailored 
to whatever is going on with the client. It's not a curriculum. It's not at two months we talk about this. Of course, there's age appropriate stuff that we do address at those times, but we're able to address whatever issues. You know, if mom gets diagnosed with gestational diabetes, we're there with information about that. Um, if there's something going on with the ultrasound, we're there with information. So it, we, we're allowed to tailor, which is awesome, the, um, the, the information that we present. So every so the visits are every two weeks. Um, and usually what we do is um, on one visit, we talk about milestones. What, what is baby doing? What is baby experiencing? What should baby be doing? Um, what, what should we expect? How can I influence these things if they're not happening to happen? What opportunities do I need to provide this baby to um, help this baby uh, develop normally? And then the second visit of the month is usually what's called um, a pipe lesson, which is a, um, I don't know, you would ask me that and I forgot what pipe stands for. <laughs> um, pipe is a hands-on lesson. Um, it's just for example, one is called Reading to Baby. So we take out a book and we you know, sit on the floor, placement with the child. Uh, sometimes we bring a baby doll out so that we are not um, infringing on that parent's Role with their child. You know, if I have success with someone's child and they're not able to have success, that's very defeating. So I use the baby doll and they use their real baby. And then we present, like, reading to baby and, you know, present ideas like it doesn't have to be a story that you read your baby. Point. Where's the mouse? Where's the ball? You know, things that are um, maybe this is too narrow minded for. Or, or the idea that they have that I have to read the story to the baby and the baby doesn't want to listen to the story. Oh, no, it's just about age appropriate interactions. And so every other week we have things about attachment. I mean, I'm sorry, every other visit, we have things about attachment, um, discipline, um, everything that you would need for parenting skills, hands on lessons every other visit to uh, reinforce those behaviors and those realistic expectations that you need for your child so that they understand what's appropriate and what's expected at this time. Mm -hmm. Are you guys using any kind of like trauma-informed care? Um, talking about that with, with families, talking about, um, I know a lot of our agencies, um, those are a lot of requirements now, especially our foster agencies, to talk about trauma-informed care and present those kinds of trainings, um, the ACEs study, um, to look at their history and the way that they were brought up and how they can stop that, that circle of, whatever it is, you know, domestic violence or abuse or whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have been to, um, we went to a training not too long ago about trauma-informed care. And so just in the, in the works of Nurse Family Partnership, the assessments that we do with mom, we assess for domestic violence. We assess for um, pre, uh, depression in uh, prenatal care and postpartum depression. So that continues for like a year. Um, we do the generalized anxiety screening. So um, we don't, we have not incorporated ACEs into our assessments. Um, that is something that I think we're moving towards because every, every conference we've been to, every presentation, there's always uh, information about trauma-based care, I mean trauma-informed care. And um, that is, um, it's so, it's so, um, I, don't know, I can't think of a better word, but invasive. When you just meet this person and you're like, I've been sexually abused. So this is a really relationship-based program, and, and it takes time to develop that rapport with somebody. Um, kind of a funny side note, when we were screening for um, uh, partner on um, partner violence, we, um, it, it, it looked like domestic violence and inner partner violence went up during the Nurse Family Partnership program, and we were like, what? What, what is happening here? Well, it turns out that, it, you know, the first screening was a little early and people were like, mm, I'm not really ready to talk about that with you. And then further, as we develop that relationship, you know, now they disclose it at, you know, month six and we're like, oh dear, you know, but that is the nature of, of building a relationship with somebody. So I would really, really like to see Nurse Family Partnership uh, incorporate ACEs, um, really surely on the basis that it tells you so much about a person. And sometimes people don't even realize that, um, that, that, is, that is a trauma that they've experienced as a child, you know, maybe not having enough food or something like that. So um, I, I, I do foresee that coming into our um, assessment. Cool, cool, I like that. Okay. 
Yeah. Very cool. Do you have any like um, fun statistics about, you know, nurse family partnership, like things that you've accomplished or, you know, just any fun numbers that you have about it? Yeah, I do. Um, the, the website has some great research. So let me just tell you a little bit about some of the goals um, of, the, of the program. Sure. So, um, of course, it's to prevent um, child abuse and neglect. And um, the other two other goals uh, improve school readiness and, um, of course, to change the trajectory of this mom's life and her baby's life. Mm -hmm. um, that's some fun statistics. So um, the RAND Corporation did a study in 2017, and um, their estimate was that for every dollar invested by the community in nurse family partnership, the community would see a $5.70 return on that investment, which wow. is wow. enormous. Yes. Um, and be, and the, the reason that's true is because um, they saw, there's, an, there's a study called the Elmira trial. I believe Elmira was the place that they did the study, um, but it's the longest study that they have to date with uh, information. And so 48% reduction in um, state verified rates of child abuse and neglect. And we all know how expensive it is to um, remove a child and place them in foster care. That is an extreme burden. Um, just the cost of that. So 46, I'm sorry, 48% reduction, 56% uh, relative reduction in uh, emergency department visits for injuries and ingestions during the first two years of life. Um, so, and we monitor that the entire time that they're, um, that they're on the program. We keep reporting every, actually every visit we report whether or not there's been an emergency room visit and why. 59% um, decrease in arrests by age 15, which is you know, huge taxpayer ex ex um, expense to to house juveniles in the system and, and pay for their incarceration 59 percent reduction for that and a 67 percent reduction in um, behavioral and intelligence issues by age six so these are the things that are costing um, the state and state agencies and state services to pay for these things and nurse family partnership um, as an evidence-based practice reduces those things enormously. I would say those statistics are enormous. Right, right. Absolutely. I mean, and that follows exactly in line with, you know, all the trauma-informed care um, statistics, you know, that pre-birth all the way to age, about age three is so crucial and so important for yeah. all the outcomes that are going to come later in their life. And so, you know, you guys getting in there and being able to help and point in the right direction and teach and observe. Um, I, I'm so excited to be hearing more about this. Um, so for all the other states, I know for you talked about kind of referrals here. Um, we have um, customers all over the United States, Canada, all over the place. We have foster agencies, treatment centers, and we have a lot of community-based programs as well. Um, so for community-based programs, um, if they have nurse family partnership in their state, how would they go about contacting that person? Is there a website or a place where they can go to, to make those referrals? Yeah, nursefamilypartnership.org um, okay. is the, it, we're based in Colorado. The National Service Office is in Colorado, actually Denver. And uh, so they run the website and if there's a place there, um, it, it's really a very informative website. It has all the statistics that I just read for you. Um, it has uh, a place where you can go and it shows you know, a map of all the sites in the state. Um, and then you can click on each individual state and it'll tell you where the closest nurse family partnership is. Um, I know in, I'm in Lubbock, in, in Lubbock, Texas. And so uh, we serve the nine counties that touch Lubbock. Um, so for Texas, we have a very unique role because there's not a lot of people that are serving rural communities. So rural, rural, the rural community is a whole animal of itself. There's very little resource out there. So um, that, that depends on the site for each state, how far they can travel to see, um, to see clients. But um, yeah, there, on the website, there's a place to click and it'll give you the information on who to contact in that state. Um, and there's also um, information on there if you would like to be, if you're interested in opening a site for Nurse Friendly Partnership, how you might partner with people to be able to do that and to bring that, uh, this uh, program to your area. So that's something that um, we need more of. We need expansion. This is a wonderful program, uh, but you know, because of the amount of time that it takes to serve someone, uh, we, we have between 25 and 30 clients. So um, it's intense, uh, but there's only, you know, there's only so many people we can serve. And so the more agencies that we have, the better. Right, absolutely. Okay, 
All right. Um, we talked about how people can find that. What about, um, this isn't one of the questions that we talked about, but do you all participate? I mean, if you are working with a foster home or if you are working with um, a community-based programs, do you guys talk to everybody? I mean, do you, would you ever come to different kinds of meetings or do you kind of that wraparound services and participate in those types of meetings? Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, I, have a, I have a client that's in foster care with her baby right now. And okay. so um, it's been, this is my first time for that, uh, that experience, but it's been, it's been awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, we work with the placement agency, mm -hmm. uh, we work with CPS, her council worker has been at my visits before. So we're very involved with whoever wants to provide um, services with this kid. We want them to know, um, not only just not to overlap, but to, get, like you said, wrap around because she will graduate from our program when she's two. I mean, when the baby's two. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately for this kiddo, uh, she won't even be graduated from high school yet. You know, that seems mm -hmm. wrong <laughs> to me. I'm like, can we just hang on to you until there's a major milestone met? So, um, but we, you know, we can't. So we have to have those services in place and um, the PALS program here, uh, you know, encouraging him to do that so that they have those services afterwards and, and trying to see into the future about how, how all these agencies can come together and continue to serve this kid and, and provide uh, services for her after we're not there anymore. So absolutely, we encourage that. We want to meet the people that are in her life that are there to um, provide other services and how we can um, work together to make sure that she gets everything she needs to parent. Yeah, awesome, awesome. I love to hear stories like that and hear you know, how, how we're not being siloed anymore you know, with services that we're giving for, for different people, but trying to do more community-based and trying to do more wraparound services where there's multiple people touching, you know, like that example with the foster kiddo and trying to, you know, get her, not only is she in foster care from the baby and then, and, you know, giving her the best possible, you know, life outcome as, as possible. So that is awesome. Thank you so much for being with us and thanks for sharing Nurse Family Partnership. Um, all of you out there in podcast land, you know, if you have Nurse Family Partnership um, in your state, look it up, get familiar, reach out to them. Um, you know, just like Kim was saying, Saying, even if you're doing foster care services, there might be opportunities for your teens that are in, um, in foster care that are having babies to have this extra support from their family partnership. Um, those of you with community-based services, this would be a great referral um, to and even from, you know, getting to know your nurse family partnership folks in your state. And then, like you said, trying to bring that into your state if you're not currently um, participating in that program. And I think, did you say that you... Um, there's grants to draw down, federal grants for this program to draw down? Yes, there, there's federal money. Um, they're called uh, McV sites. Um, it's a long an acronym, but that money was allocated to expand Nurse Family Partnership. Um, we're not a McV site because we existed before that money uh, came down. But yeah, there's federal money to draw from. There's usually state money allocated. So, and then if you get a partnering agency that can sort of um, house you know, employees and things like that, that makes it a whole lot easier. So. But yes, there is absolutely money out there to, to bring the program to your area. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Leanna, did you have any follow-up questions or anything that you wanted to ask? Um, well, I did have one other thing that I know we didn't really touch on. I saw on the site that you also have like this really cool chat feature um, with the dietitians and the uh, lactation specialists. So you wanna to touch on that for just a second? Yeah. So. Um, there's a, there is a, a big alumni group. We really try hard to include moms because who better to tell the story right. than a mom who's been through this program and has a child and they're just flying high, super successful, you know, graduating from college and all these amazing things. Who better to tell the story and to advocate for us? So we have a huge alumni group. There's a big draw um, to have alumni maybe um, speak and do lobbying work and come and you know, talk to um, our lawmakers. Um, and also, we also just launched uh, an app called Goal Mama, and Goal Mama is really specifically targeted towards helping people, uh, I mean, helping our moms make um, progress on their goals and, and, you know, making small goals to meet larger goals. And there's an, uh, a feature in, within that app that allows them to connect with each other um, and for them to reach out for questions and things like that by um, someone who knows better than just a Facebook chat. So to get some real information, true information, um, and then through the website, interconnecting with moms all over that have graduated from the program 
um, in order to continue those services when they need um, to reach out and have a question that they it's there for them. So so it's not there's no wraparound service per se, um, but just um, a check in and um, you know here and there to answer questions and things like that. And then hopefully the alumni community will be able to support each other. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, having that type of community support is just so important. And, you know, all the features that you have and all the things that you guys do is just so cool and just so very important. And I'm so glad that we were able to, you know, talk about this today and get to know this uh, more. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, there's a reason why I've been there for nine years. It's an amazing program. I'm, I'm basically part of these people's families. Like, people will come from other houses to come to our visits so we can talk about things and just have that relationship, it's amazing. So right. two years is a really long time, but it is, it's such a worthy investment. Absolutely, and I mean, you're doing such great work. I mean, the, you know, not only does the statistics prove it, but just the way that you talk about your families and working with everybody, you know, that, that proves how, how great it is. So Kim, thanks for being with us today and sharing. It was great to, to reconnect with you and to hear about the Nurse Family Partnership. Um, and we're gonna put out some more information. We'll put out the website link. Um, and anything else that, Kim, if you want to share anything else that we can put out when we send out our podcast, we'll send that out. Um, otherwise, thank you so much. And uh, everybody have a great Halloween. I guess that's the closest uh, <laughs> coming up. Get your favorite candy. And uh, yeah, have a, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody that's watching. Thanks for what you do. We appreciate uh, all of the time that you put in for our, our kiddos and our families all across the United States. So we'll talk to you guys next time. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye.